right, welcome back to On the Delo, and I couldn't have timed that any more perfect with the intro. Um, my guest, <laughs> Stephen, his phone's going off like a, a Kmart blue light special. <laughs> Was that important? You no. get that? We're good? Yeah? Oh, we're good. All right. Well, dude, welcome to the podcast, man. I'm excited Thanks to for have having you. Me. I know. How long, how long have we been, I don't know, friends, hanging out, doing business? Oh, got it. Well over a decade, a de for sure. Yeah. Well over that. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's crazy. And what's interesting is that we probably ran in a lot of the same circles even prior to that with my experience in, in the music business and you just starting out in, what, 2000? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely I knew your name for quite a while before we worked together because it just, yeah, just a similar circle. Right. Everyone's yeah. like, you don't know D'Lo? And I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. I was hanging up, first. I was probably hanging up posters for some of your shows or Charlie right. shows or whatever at ASU, <laughs> you know, at the time when they had those big kiosks and you could staple That's, gun I shit. I used to do that all day long. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. so funny. Now, I, do they even have those anymore? Have you been to ASU? I, I don't know. Yeah. We're old, uh, dude. I'm old. <laughs> yeah. if, if we walked around ASU, they would probably, um, they'd probably escort us out. Yeah. Old creepy men. Or tell us to go back to, what's the, what's the old people's home right there on ASU now? Uh, <laughs> that's right. Like, oh. It's just like, oh, the old people got out of the home. That's right. They uh, built, a, they they ruined our chilies to build an old yeah. people's home. Yeah. Because that's, that's what everyone thought when you look at Millen University was like, I know what this intersection needs, a senior living facility. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Who, who knows? Everybody thinks differently. So you started promoting in 2000. That was what? It, it, you were you were prone in high school, though, right? Yeah, I was still in high school. I graduated in 01, just started promoting my friends' bands and doing shows at Modified and then The Nile and The Underground and then Nita's Hideaway and kind of all the smaller spots, lots of other weird DIY spots that don't exist. And then I yeah. was doing it through in high school and then through college and, you know, started doing other things for other people, but still doing like sort of my DIY shows. So I was like working for the marquee, actually doing all their flyering and going around putting up posters. That's, right. That's what I was doing for the marquee as like a co college sort of side, jo you know, part-time job. And, but I was, it was great because I was working for the marquee. They were paying me to go flyer all over town. And then I would take my flyers with me. Double duty. And so my stuff, you know, I was doing these small DIY shows, but the posters and flyers were everywhere. Yeah. Because they were everywhere the marquee stuff was. What was your, yeah. like, if you can remember, not necessarily your, your first show, but what was your... What was your love and what was your engagement with wanting to, you know, to do this? You, you saying, I'm going to give this a try. <clears throat> Whoops. Uh, it just kind of happened. I, I, I was just going to a lot more shows than any of my friends in high school. Like I just turned 16, started going to small shows and just fell in love with music. And so then I would go to lots of shows by myself, even at like 16 or 17. Yeah. And then that forced me to make friends at those shows, you know, because I'd like go by myself and be like, oh, I'm going to go talk to the band and I'm talking like small shows and local shows and shows with 50 people or 100 people or whatever. And so like I just knew lots of people in the music scene mm -hmm. and all my friends band in high school who were in bands didn't necessarily know as many people outside of our high school. Like they didn't – it was like, oh, we want to play a modified. And I was like, well, I know them. I can call them because I kind of had a rapport and just sort of was like this little – you know, total middleman in like, oh yeah, I know that band. I can, oh, you want to play with that band? Oh, oh I know them. I can call them. You're and connecting you're people. Just connecting people. And it just sort of, there wasn't a goal or vision or, you know, it just sort of, just kind of happened. Just started doing it. You did, know, did you ever play a musical instrument or do you? No, no uh, try to, I got a bass for Christmas or birthday or Christmas or something one year and try it and never, you know, never really played <laughs> with other people. Never, in retrospect, just gave up way to like, yeah. Oh, wait, this is hard. Okay. <laughs> Next hobby. You know, never right. really got into playing music. Yeah. Do you find yeah. with a lot of promoters out there that that's kind of the case? None of them really play uh, music? I think it's like half and half. Like, I know yeah. uh, a lot who, yeah, were never involved in music at all, or I mean, never performers. At, at all. And then I know a lot who that's how they got into it. And, you know, thinking David Sleets down in Hotel Congress, he was a musician who yeah. that led to his job. You know, now he was a musician who had this part time job and now that's his full time job. And he's, you know, right. Does music sometimes, you know, and like I know a lot of some people that that is how they got into it is because they're ex-musicians and 
they sort of well the music didn't really go where I wanted it to, but I went the business doing it, so now yeah I have this skill set. So I don't I don't know. It seems half and half. It, it, yeah, maybe half and half. Oh. You know, a lot of there's a lot of failed musicians in the business. Well, I I, yeah. I think yeah. I mean, I guess it's all in the eye and the uh, eye of the beholder, right? I mean, what uh-huh. what is the um, what, what is good music? You know, it just depends on the ears listening, right? No, oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I'm sure so, there's some shows out there that you promote, and you're like, I, I just I don't fucking get it, and then all of a sudden it's sold out. Yeah, I mean, you kind of can't predict. You know, as much as we do this, you <laughs> still kind of can't predict, and it's it's. Uh, I very much live in a. We take lots of chances because we don't know what is and isn't gonna succeed or work, and we try invest in a lot of different artists and some of them go on to be hugely successful and some don't and i can't pretend that i've got a really great you know sometimes you see something and you think wow this is incredible this is surely going to be a success and then it doesn't work for whatever reasons and yeah sometimes you're totally surprised where you go what those guys succeeded and you know we're you never know you know, what, so what's an example of say like a band that you really loved and, and invested a lot since the very beginning, and then just ended up blowing up and being successful and blowing up, or? commercially successful? Let's just say making oh. money. I mean, there's Frank Turner is one that we I did a ton of shows for very early on. We did a show very early on for Ghost, and they blew up and became wow. huge. Uh, yeah, we've worked with a ton of. Recently, Charlie Crockett and Mitski are both acts that we were doing sort of pre-pandemic and since pandemic have just been gigantic. Um, yeah, so there's it's lots quite of artists. A few, yeah. Now over the years, it's, uh, we just announced we're bringing back the Front Bottoms. They're playing the Marquee this fall. And, you know, the first several shows I did with them, you know, had 30 people, 100 people. And, you know, we've sold out the Van Buren with them twice. And now we're going to the Marquee. And, yeah. you know, like... Which is so thousands would, of people. Uh, yeah, people thousands yeah. of people. So, you know, that's a band we've been working with since, you know, no one knew who they were, and now they're hugely yeah. successful. So, Is there a certain, um, how do I say, performa or mindset when you're doing something inside a venue that only is going to hold a couple hundred as to oppose, like, a couple thousand? Uh, I think that... For me, I'm one is the, j- j- just the risk portfolio, uh, the risk one. When we're going into somewhere like the Van Buren or the Marquee, we have to be sort of really confident in getting the deal right and really confident that the artist is where we think they are. Or yeah, not. I'm a very conservative promoter in that I don't chase a lot of it. Like if I don't have a good feeling, I'm not going to chase it. You know, very conservative in my booking as far as financially in my, the deals. Yeah. Whereas. You know, when we're talking at Rebel Lounge or Valley Bar, it's like, well, how much can this, you know, we can take a lot of chances and right. there's a lot of variability. We're wrong all the time. We're right all the time. You know, we're right all the time and we're wrong all the time, you know, and we can take chances of, I don't know what this is worth, but it sounds cool. Let's try it. <laughs> right. You know, when you get to the Van Buren and you're talking tens and thousands of dollars in risk it's it's i gotta have a pretty good feeling you you gotta have a good track record of Mm -hmm. do we know where this is to cut the right deal and so at the smaller end you can make just i have no idea if this is worth let's try it yeah you know yeah and for people that don't know you own rebel lounge which is out here and how long how long have you owned that we just turned eight years. That's crazy. Eight years old. Yeah. How many so, people is that? What's your max capacity there? Three twenty-five. Three twenty-five. And and prior yeah. to podcast, we were just talking about how there's you know it's a little bit difficult to park, and it can <laughs> squeeze three hundred and twenty-five people in there. But it's it's an iconic building because it used to be called what used to be called the Mason Jar, and yeah. you know at the times, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, everybody from Pearl Jam to Metallica to Megadeth. I mean, they've all kind of stepped everyone foot in played there. there. Nirvana played there. Tool played there, Raging Against the Machine. Lincoln Park's first show is wow. as Lincoln Park. They played under another name, but their first public show as Lincoln Park was at the Mason Jar. So, and then it was a music venue long before that. It was a venue in the 1940s. So I mean, it's been a nightclub and live music place longer than rock and roll. Yeah. So it did take a break, and it was it was it was a gay it's bar. Been, it's been a couple different. Ga- it was between Mason Jar and Rebel. It was. Uh, Two different gay bars, one called the Anvil that still exists. They they moved. Okay. And we came in when they moved. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but all sort of underground nightlife spot. Yeah. 
Wow, that's yeah. that's awesome. Do you have like you promote a lot of bands that I look admittedly I never heard of like any of them. And obviously you make a business out of this. The the bands I'm sure I would probably love most of them if I took the time, mm-hmm. but I, look, I'm the first to admit I'm a, a product of the of the 80s. I'm a butt rocker, you know. <laughs> so do you make fun of people like me that like Rat and Winger and shit like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, when you say rat and winger, ah. how can you not? But, okay, how about uh, no, Van Halen? But, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, so much of what we do is inherently new music, and it is inherently young. You okay. know, I know it's now 20-plus years ago when I started this business. It was very much because I was that young person who knew what my friends liked, ah. and I was talking to all my friends, and a lot of my early shows would be I would know half the people in the room or a lot of the people in the room, and then now transform, I know a lot of the people in the room's parents who are standing in the back <laughs> with me, you know, because a lot of the shows we do are a lot of teenagers and a lot of college That's kids awesome. that, like, I'm now definitively outside of that demo. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, and we're constantly booking things that, you know, my friends and people my age or older don't know. And it's like, yeah, I mean, how many people in their 40s listen to brand new bands that no one's heard of? It's very few. And and that's a large part of what we do is new artists. And so I know a lot of people don't know a lot of the acts we book. One of my favorite ones, though, is like when that artist does get to a point where they're starting to break through or get a larger fan base. And then people come up and will be like, why hasn't this band ever played here? And it's be like, we've had them at Rebel like five times. <laughs> you know, like they've played Arizona. T- they've been playing here for 10 years. You just discovered them. And sometimes when an artist like just blows up and you go like, wow, how how have I heard about this? And then, I mean, that just, that, you know, That's gonna happens make you all the time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Charlie Crockett's a great example of that. We had him at Rebel three times and you have to be super hip country fan to know who he was then. And then now he's massive, yeah. you know, and we get, that's the funnest part of my job is we get to kind of watch that and watch that transition. Mitski, the same thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. She's, you know, we, her show last time at Van Buren sold out the day it went on sale. You That's know? great. And we have uh, coming up in December. We have TV Girl who sold out Van Buren the day we went on sale. We had them on the main stage at Arizona Festival. Right. But we were booking them at Trunk Space with a hundred people there. And and, know, and so people bar. know what does Van Buren hold? About two thousand. About two thousand. I yeah. mean, you're selling da- da- yeah. That's huge. Yeah, we sold out the day it went on sale, and you know, we're trying to add a second date, and it did, couldn't make the dates work. But yeah. uh, you know. The demands there, but like that's a band we've been working with for years. How, how has the the risk reward over the years been for you? I mean, obviously good enough for you to keep doing it. I, do, do you feel uh, stressed most of the time? Or <laughs> <laughs> a very astute question there. Uh, it it it's harder and harder. I mean, the 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 risk on these shows is greater than it's ever been. The the expense to put them on is yeah uh, greater than it's ever been. Um, I think one that most consumers would not realize is concert tickets are like the one category that lags inflation. Consumers have such a good deal on concert tickets compared. They're one of the few consumer products that radically follows inflation, not inflationary. Uh, the other obvious big categories like big TVs, they keep getting cheaper and cheaper yeah. relative to their inversely related to inflation. But concert tickets are one that... You know, there's a lot of people talking about how expensive concert tickets are, but they really aren't historically. I think they're just something that people just have such an emotional connection to that they're very sensitive about. But these shows, it's more and more expensive to do do them. Like just like the one piece you deal with, the insurance on them is more and more right. expensive to insure these things. Every single line item is just harder to do. So. This is awesome because this was one of my questions. And so Zona was a um, a big event that you did, you mm-hmm. know, last year. Um, and <laughs> fuck, it rained one of the days, right? Yeah, we rained all day one day. Yeah, and then it was muddy all day the next day. Can't predict for that. So okay. as, as we get into this, how much were you charging for like a Zona ticket for the weekend? Uh, single day tickets were around ninety bucks and fees, so a little over a hundred probably. Yeah. And how many how many bands were there? Uh, we had 
around 50 total. It's a steal. Something like, yeah. Absolute steal. So now, out of this, so you got to sell a lot of tickets because out of yeah. this 100 bucks, you, you got to pay taxes, you got to pay service fees, you got to pay insurance, you got to pay security, you got to pay fencing. I mean, what am I, what you, else? You missed the biggest one. It didn't even the get big, the biggest the, category. The park itself? No, the, uh, the artist. The, the artist. artist. Fees. Oh, shit. That, yeah. You, you missed half the expense <laughs> you that everything you read off. too, probably. A lot of that was up front, a lot of big deposits. Uh, especially the higher end of the, the the top of the lineup, big deposits to announce. Uh, yeah, they're incredibly risky, biz- very risky, low reward businesses. So why do you do it? I don't know. <laughs> That's where that psycho part comes in, I guess. Psycho, st- yeah. yes, which is your promotion. Yeah, no, but I mean, it's it's the the. Concert prices have not held with inflation, but every single expense item does. Yeah. Right. So every item is more and more expensive. Right. And we were just looking the other day and like just looking at what it costs us to do a show at Rebel eight years ago versus today. Mm. You know, a lot of that is labor, but a lot of it is other things that it's just much more expensive to do that same show today than it was Eight years ago. Eight years ago, yeah. yeah. And and would you say that you've created a niche with these younger bands in the aspect of um, maybe the bidding war isn't quite as bad as when, like, you know, the the bigger promoters out there are bidding for the Aerosmiths and, and stuff like that? Uh, sometimes, though, I think it might even be the opposite, where at the smaller at the smaller level where no one is making money, yeah, there's so much more... Like trying to fight to get that deal right is almost harder than on some of the bigger shows. The okay. bigger shows, it's there's a big pot. We all kind of have a vague idea about how we're going to divide that big pot. And kind of things are what they are, and you know, once you get to a big enough level, everyone's making money, and so like you still have the fights and definitely there. Yeah. But at the small level, it's really hard to like because no one's making money, and so like how do you split a pot when it's not the pot isn't big enough? Yeah, you're going to get a lot more, te- you, you know a lot more attention. Like some of the bigger deals are easier to do because it's just like, we're going to give you all the money. And everyone's like, yes, that's what we want. Done. It's, right. it's a little easier to to do some of the bigger deals than it is some of the smaller ones where it just doesn't work. Doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. Is, is co-promoting a nightmare sometimes? Uh, we co-promote with a lot of people. So we're, I mean, we actually are do that all day long. Yeah. Uh, you know, I at least probably some of the stress, right? So, some of the stress. And yeah. it's, uh, not fighting about the shows. Like I talked to lots of promoters in other markets and Phoenix is a very weird market in that we all kind of work together. We all work a lot. Like I go into the Van Buren, they come into my room. I go into yeah. Crescent, they come into my room. Like Mar- Marquee, I go yeah. into Marquee, Tom comes into my room. So we all kind of work together in a way that in some other markets, you know, it's very no one works together. It's very, yeah. which option are you doing? Everybody out here um, really, I mean, because I'm out here and I see it and I'm in the entertainment business in one aspect, everybody really knows each other and it seems like a good... Very small. Yeah, it's very small. It's a small. very small community. Yeah. I was talking to an artist, a, a young artist recently about this and how like, we were, we were kind of talking about how you can't burn bridges in this market because like the number of people that were booking cool concerts in Phoenix 10 years ago <laughs> versus today right. is basically the same, same list of people. Like, there's very little change. Yeah. The, the bands have all changed. The shows have changed. Some of the venues have changed. But, like, the number of people that are putting on quality shows is a very similar list to what was 10 years ago, at least at, like, the club I level. would totally agree with that. I, yeah. yeah, we're all the same faces. It's all the same. It's yeah. Michelle at the Nile. She does a great job yeah. there. It's Mike Horwitz at Universitile. It's Thomas Turner and, and the crew at Relentless. Like, yeah. that list of people is very similar to what it was 10 years ago. Arizona's got its own little niche, and you guys have your own little niche inside yeah. of that niche. Yeah. yeah. That's, so, that's very cool. Yeah, so we kind of work with everybody, you know, and it's like I kind of like that being in a position of working with everybody. It's easier to work with everybody than fight with everybody. I have to say, like, when when I was younger and I had a, a band called Idols of Perversity, um, <laughs> I was a, I was a you know, co-manager, and we would be booked at the uh, at the uh, Mason Jar, and, you know, you know, Franco would be there, oh, that, yeah, you know, you know, it's my short Italian imitation. <laughs> I'd walk around with his wig and his clogs and, and all, the, all the good stuff, and we would actually put big boa constrictors in there, and we would light incense. Now, this is before insurance, and I knew what a fire hazard this was. <laughs> 
<laughs> and um, he would just freak out. I mean, it was crazy. But man, we packed that place, and the energy of like you know local people coming in, and you having three hundred people in there rocking out to industrial yeah. weird music at the time. It was fun. Yeah. So yeah, I, good good times. So let's talk about let, let's talk about just kind of your your life in music and and all the other things that you do. I know you you go to South by Southwest. You probably go seek bands there. You've been a speaker there. How, how has that been for you? I, I go to South by almost every year. I go in waves of love South by. Uh, <laughs> it, it's it's a weird different thing, but it is about discovering new music and being you know so many agents and managers and. It, just so many other industry there. Uh, one of the things I started doing the last couple of years is uh, just walking into shows with like zero idea what I'm walking into. That's like, because cool. uh, there's so little where you do that, where you just walk in with no context and, yeah. you know, discovered some really cool bands that way. And somewhere didn't realize, like, I went to meet up with a friend last year and was like, oh, had zero idea what he was at. Didn't even ask. He's like, I'm at Stubbs. I'm like, I'll meet you there. Walk in. We're watching this band. I was like, oh, do you know who we're watching? And he's like, oh, it's this band Pom Pom Squad. And I was like, oh, that's great. I have them in Underground in like two weeks and oh, wow. had no idea. And then I randomly walked into a show of theirs the next day. Uh, there's this great band from Canada, Elevator, uh, that I discovered that I just, I had like an hour to kill. And I was like, I'm just going to walk next door and see whoever's playing. And like, that's been really they fun. Um, yeah, I try to get to three or four major festivals every year. Last year I did Coachella, Tree Fort, and Outside Lands. This year I'm going to go to Lollapalooza. I did Riot Fest last year. I try I'm trying to mix up what festivals I go to. You must have yeah. a blast though. It's probably just a lot of networking and a lot. Of, it's it, ear it's candy. one where it's uh it it it's fun and it it's weird to describe to people who don't understand because it's never not working but it's also it's never just straight fun and it's never not working it's kind of this weird yeah. in between you're like half on half off like i still i still get to have a lot of fun and still have a good time yeah. you know but then it's also oh but i got to go meet this person in vip to go there's some an agent to talk to and some of that's really fun and it's like get to go hang out with my buddy and sometimes it's like <laughs> oh, i got to go meet with this person and it's both you know so it's 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 the fun perk of the job. Yeah. You know, does so. that get harder as you get older? It's traveling and staying up and all yeah. that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, I rarely the last person in my shows anymore. I used to be all the time. Yeah. You know, I have reps running all my shows so, like, I can kind of come and go. It definitely. <laughs> Good since COVID, since COVID, the answer to that has been a very big yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure, you for know. sure. And um, and uh, talking about during COVID, I want to talk about uh, Neva. Is that yeah? Neva. Yeah. So you kind of were the founder, one of the founders. Okay, one yeah. of the founders. So explain to people like how big this is because this was such an awesome thing to see dur uh, during this. Yeah. So at the start of COVID in March 2020, we were doing these calls of all these local or not local, uh, all these music venues, small music venues and promoters, um, and just realizing no one was talking about us. We were the most affected businesses by COVID, you know, our saying, and it was totally true, we were the first businesses to be shut down or to be affected, and we were the last businesses to come back, you know, and still probably facing more ripples than most industries still from COVID. Uh, and at the time, every, everyone was writing these stories like, oh, Coachella will be fine. They'll be back. Oh, the NBA will be fine. Don't worry about sports. Here's why sports is going to be fine. All these big giant arenas, they're fine. They'll, they'll survive. And we're just going, well, no one's talking about us. Like all the reasons why those big entities could survive, like the NBA has TV rights. We don't have any of that, yeah. you know, and, uh, don't have big government support the way stadiums and arenas, you know, a lot of which are municipally owned, are no one is talking about how this is going to be. And we all knew, remember, this is the point where everyone was saying flatten the curve. It's going to be two weeks or is it a month? Right. And we all knew, like, this is not going to be a month and it's going to take forever to turn back. Like, how fast we turned off concerts, we're not going to be able to turn them back on that way. And so we started NEVA, which is the National Independent Venue Association, which is a trade association to represent venues. There's never been anything quite like it. And there's similar organizations, but nothing quite the same for 
our space and started immediately. We had one goal, which was lobby the federal government for support. This is sort of in the wake of the first round of PPP, which did not work for businesses that were completely shut down. This right. is about retaining employees. Well, if I'm at 0% operation, I can't retain any of my employees. So like that, that was really badly designed for us. For a lot of people, that was great. And that was right. the aid that some people needed. Uh, but for a lot of us, it was really not a good option. And so we started lobbying, started the Save Our Stages campaign, which gradually led to Senator John Cornyn and Senator Amy Klobuchar uh, introducing the Save Our Stages Act that we ended up getting passed at the end of 2020, which was a grant program through the SBA, Small Business Administration, that was $16 billion in aid Wow! for music venues, per- promoters, talent representatives, m- in the process, uh, movie theaters, zoos, museums, and aquariums all got added into this Stru- the structure, and we were one of only three industries that got specific aid. There was a lot of business aid in general. There was another round of PPP. There was a lot of yeah. aid for business, but only three businesses got specific name in that st- stimulus bill, and that was us, independent venues, the airlines, and the postal service. Those wow. were the only three specific industries that got aid, and we were one of them. Uh, and so, yeah, so we spent all year <laughs> lobbying for that. and uh, That's phenomenal. Yeah, so like, it's, the largest art, it's the largest public funding of the arts in American history by a magnitude of 100 times <laughs> previous. Yeah, you know, and you're, so, one of, you're one of the badasses yeah. that got this yeah, thing started. Yeah, I was very... Was a founding board member and very instrumental in that process. That's beautiful, dude. That's yeah, such a, a wonderful ton of thing. people. But it was also we had so many volunteers and so many people. It really was a big little grassroots movement yeah. where we had all these artists and people who were going through COVID like everyone else. But for all these venue employees and promoters and venue owners, we we're literally shut down. There was no work. There's nothing, right? And so all these people were donating all their time to helping Neva and help this mission because they really cared about it. And it really struck a nerve where, you know, Congress really noticed. And the other one that was really instrumental was we kept it totally by, it was a completely bipartisan movement. Like yeah. we did not, which trying to keep... <laughs> A political movement in 2020, yeah, bipartisan, like was kind of one of the hardest parts because we had support from all across the political spectrum because everyone sort of realized that this is different. This is a constituent that's never had a voice before. There's never been anyone advocating for venues like this. Yeah, the uh, not you know there's all these people lobbying for what they needed help in COVID and and a lot of people needed help. But all these longstanding organizations and institutions, and we had to build it on the scratch. Like we didn't have, there was no one advocating for it. And it kind of was part of it because we got to start with no bag. We had no baggage. We had no alliances that were pre-existing, you know. So, you know, our bill was supported by some of the most conservative members of Congress and some of the most liberal members of Congress. And we managed to keep it that way. And everyone was trying to pull us in different, you should attach to this cause. And they're like, no, no, this organization has one goal and we're staying out of all the rest of it. That's and awesome. trying to balance that in 20, 20, in the middle of the 2020 election, keep a completely nonpartisan political act yeah. like that was a, uh, that's a story in itself, man. Yeah, yeah. They gotta do a documentary on you on that. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a, yeah. That's that's great. I wanted. There I wanted are a lot so of people many to hear stories that. out of. There are so many fun stories out of that year. It was very weird. Yeah, uh, that's that's yeah. stuff that we'll have to get into another time. That's really yeah. cool, though. Um, tell me a little bit about you. Like, I, I, people like to hear kind of um, about my guest a little bit personally. So, like, what does your day look like? I mean, I know it's probably a little bit different than when you were younger. So, I mean, do you go to bed at an average time or? I, all over the map. Like, there's some nights where I'm getting home after a show at 2 a.m. and there's some nights where I'm in bed at 9. If I'm at shows most most nights, but not always at this point. Uh, definitely trying to not be at everything. Um, you know, we produced somewhere around 700 concerts last year. Wow. I can't be at all of them. No. <laughs> I mean, some nights we have six shows in a night, and I just, I physically can't be at all of them. 
Uh, and those don't just happen. Yeah. Like during the day, you're on the phone, yeah, we're in, and talking. And yeah, we're in a. Uh, there's now nine of us in my office, huh. uh, full time. Or we do work in the office, but everyone very flexible. People do work from home quite a bit, yeah. but we're mostly in the office. Or, but yeah, there's nine of us that are in the office making all those shows happen. You know, I've got two full time graphic designers on, three people working on marketing. It's crazy. You know, me and Jeff do Jeff Taylor, my uh, GM and talent buyer with Psycho Steve, like booking all the shows. And yeah, all the admin behind it, and you know, uh, you just yeah, do, doing it day after day. Are yeah, you, so it's full time in the office, and then going to shows. That's cool. You can yeah. probably do this forever. Uh, hopefully, most all the promoters are still around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's a different. It's weird. Sort of the position yeah. I'm in is very different than it was a few, even a few years ago. Have, have um, uh, some or not a, a lot of these artists just become like your personal friends? Uh, yeah, uh, there's lots of them who I'm super close with. You know, it's, it's that's who we work with, and yeah. there's lots of artists I I don't know ever. Like I used to know a lot more of them. It used to be when I was a one person shop and was way more involved in every single aspect. And it was a one person thing. I was a lot closer with a lot of the bands in that era. Yeah. And bands I would work with over and over. And now, you know, a lot of the newer bands I'm a little more removed from direct, so, directly. <clears throat> There's a lot more in between, you know. And part of it's generational. Like all these bands we're booking are all in their 20s and right. 40. It's like, I'm the, yeah. you know, I get it. There's a little bit of element there of. It's like hanging out with your you kids. Know. Yeah. <laughs> so, dude, there's some artists where that's. You know, we're booking lots of acts that are teenagers or some of them are. Yeah. You know, that's fun. That's so uh, much some fun. Of, some of them, it's fun to watch. Like one of my favorites and huge supporter of here, uh, Upsall. Do you know Upsall? I don't. Yeah. Uh, this girl, Taylor Upsall, we were, we were booking her when she was like 15, 16. She's playing local things at Rebel. You know, she was on the cover of Spin a few months ago. No and, kidding. You know, works with Dua Lipa and is just exploded. We had her on Zona as well and just, yeah, you know, she's touring the world. Uh, you would know her as her dad, Mike Upsall, was the singer in the band Stereo Typewriter. Okay. Do you remember those yep, guys? I do, yeah. Yeah, and he's in been in a bunch of other bands. Uh, I can't, he's Kid, in a bunch of bands. Yeah, it's so, funny. Kids, uh, of, kids of artists are coming yeah, out now. God. Yeah, so, like, I knew... I was a stereo typewriter fan before I ever started doing shows in the 90s. We'd go see them play, and then now we're promoting you know, the kid, been helping Taylor for the last decade or so. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, so. this is cool. I, I'm, I could talk to you all day about music business. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna do a qu uh, some quick uh, 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 quick fire questions. You ready? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, would you rather be on a tour bus or stay local? Um, if I I did a lot of touring. And I was always in a van. If I had been touring in a bus, I might have stayed touring. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> got the laugh track for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no. But uh, I like being local. I like working with different bands every day. Okay. Uh, um, stay up late or get up early. I'm the worst of both now because I just <laughs> now, as I'm a little older, I wake up early no matter what, even if I'm exhausted. Yeah. But then I'm still out late, so it's like I always wake up and like, why don't I sleep two more hours? I totally can. Yeah. I just can't. But you don't. I don't. You so. can, but you can't. I get that. Yeah. Man. Yeah. How so. How about death metal or jazz? Ooh, that's a hard one. Uh, live death metal, listening to jazz. Okay. Good answer. Um, would you work forever, or do you want to retire one day? I don't know. Uh, I can't imagine retiring. Yeah, I you love know. what you do. Yeah, I, I'd like to work a lot less than I do now. That would be. Yeah. That would be. <laughs> like to get to the point where I don't work as much as I am these days. But, yeah, but you still uh, get to enjoy the. Yeah. The life. Um, yeah, one of the great ones being sort of a little behind the scenes on the art. You know, like always can work. You know, we're always working with new artists. There's always going to be new artists to work with. Yeah, for sure. That's mm -hmm. uh, that's so cool. It's um, whenever there's something new and fresh in life, you know, it kind of brings life to us. I am very excited about a lot of the new music I'm seeing right now. There's so much good stuff and so much. The one observation I made recently, uh, 
it is like I really feel like ten years ago, ten plus years ago, like two thousand ten ish. It felt like every new band I was seeing was so derivative. You could look at a new band and be like, "You want to be Mumford and Sons? You want to be My Chemical Romance? You want to be Taylor Swift? Yeah. You want to be this?" Like every single band we were dealing with, it was so easy to be like, "They belong in this box," right? And they're trying so hard to be the perfect example of that thing. And so many of the new artists we're booking now, I, I think this is a different of all these ki- these young musicians growing up with Spotify. They're all over the map. Like mm. so many of these new artists, it's hard to put like where does this, where does Billie Eilish fit in the music spectrum? Yeah. Like where do a lot of these new artists? And I think that is so much more interesting. Like it, there's so, like. It's a little hard from promote because it doesn't be like, oh, you're in that box. I know how to promote that box. What do you call but it? What yeah. do I call this? And, you know, instead one artist, they complained about how we described them on an Instagram post. And it's like, dude, it was one sentence on Instagram. But like, sorry, we didn't get your genre right. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> you know, we called you what everyone else calls you. And you're not very happy with that. But, uh, you know, there's so much diversity of what's going on in music cool. right now that is really exciting it's- and just sort of see a different take right now. I love it. I love it. Um, oh. Warp Tour or Coachella? It used to be all Warp Tour, now Coachella. Okay. Uh, that's it. Definitely came out of the Warp Tour world, though. Yeah, I know you did. Um, steak, yeah. steak or sushi? Oh, definitely steak. Okay. You're a steak guy. And then this is going to be a really difficult one for you. Uh-huh. Rat or Motley Crue? Rat or Motley Crue? I could name more Motley Crue songs, so. Okay, that's good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Motley yeah. Crue it is. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, where can, um, so people that are here local in, in Arizona and or maybe traveling here, where can they, like, find you to buy tickets and, and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, uh, for the Rebel Lounge, it's just easy. It's therebellounge.com. Uh, and then for all our shows that we do outside of Rebel, it's psychosteve.com. And m- most of everything we do is on one of those two sites. Or both. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks for hanging out with me yeah, today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, rock and roll. Let's see Sweet. if I do. I have a rock and roll thing. Uh, no. Well, there no, you go. That. The drums. That's, <laughs> that's the best I got. So, thank you everybody for for listening. Another episode of On the D-Lo. Appreciate it. Go check out. You know, uh, one of uh, one of Stephen's shows. Go to Rebel Lounge if anything. I mean, if you can find something there, it's just such a great, uh, intimate Good. venue. And if you don't know anything, just pick a show and go and see something new. See yeah. something you don't. Exactly. Know. Go adventurize. Yeah. Go have some go. fun. Go walk into a show you don't know And take about. a Waymo there, you know? It'd be, a lot, it'd be a lot more fun. It'd be a whole adventurous night. So, yeah, it's mm-hmm. such, a, such a great place. And, and growing up here at Native and, and watching all the development and everything, and, and you keeping everything holistic to, you know, just the the roots is, is awesome. So Try to. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, anyways, um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Please um, uh, follow, subscribe, five star, give, you know, give go buy some concert tickets, go buy some festival tickets. Are you doing Zona again? I didn't even ask you. Uh, that's a big TBD. It's a big TBD. Okay. So yeah. if and when there's another outdoor festival that Steven happens to do, go buy some damn tickets and buy them for your mom, buy them for your dad, buy them for everybody. You know, support yes. support these uh, local promoters, um, especially because they yes. put a lot of time and work and effort into this. So until next time, um, you know, thank you, everybody. And we'll check in until then. Peace out. Peace out.